Hello and welcome to Velino's talk. My name is Velina Chakarova and I'm the director at the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy based in Vienna, Austria. My work includes research, consulting and lectures on the global system transformation and geostrategy of global actors. This podcast is produced in partnership with Bharatvarta, India's leading podcast on politics, policy, and culture. And the following episode will be dedicated to India and its geopolitical and geostrategic choices in a rapidly deteriorating environment in global affairs amid a growing systemic rivalry between the United States and China. My guest today is Vikram Sood. He is a career intelligence officer and he has served in the research and analysis wing, um, which is India's external intelligence agency, until his retirement in March 2003 after heading the organization. He has been regularly writing on intelligence, terrorism, security and foreign relations, as well as strategic issues in journals and newspapers since 2004. Most of uh, his work um, and articles are in fact posted in, um, on his own blog, uh, which is available under suitvikram.blogspot.com. He has also contributed chapters relating to security intelligence, terrorism, and India's neighborhood for various books on China and Pakistan, a topic that we will also cover during this uh, uh, digital talk. He's author of two books. One is called The Unending Game, a former um, research and analysis wing chief's insights into his espionage which was published in 2018. And his second book is The Ultimate Goal, a former research and analysis wing chief that constructs how nations construct narratives and was published in October last year. So he's currently also an advisor at the Observer Research Foundation uh, in New Delhi, which is an independent public uh, policy think tank. And I have already had the pleasure to uh, interview Samir Saran, the president of ORF, uh, during the first uh, season of uh, Valina Stock. Uh, welcome, Mr. Suit, uh, to this digital conversation. Thank you, Valina, for having me on your program. It's, it's a delight to be here. I've heard so much about you. And I know that we're going to have a very interesting discussion, freewheeling and frank discussion. Let's, let's get on with it, if you like. Absolutely. And of course, India will be, will occupy a central place in our discussion. And first and foremost, amid this emerging bifurcation of the global system, I would like to know what is your assessment, what is your um, anticipation for the future relations between the United States under Biden's administration and India. Let's start with a general assessment and then we can dive into the uh, yeah. uh, okay. problematic fields, but also the potentials for this bilateral relationship. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm not a diplomat, so I might say things diplomat, diplomats don't say. I, I, I will go ahead and say it. Now, I think today, in a long time, India US relations have not been better than done, all said and done, intention wise. We intend to get closer, a much better place than ever before. But there are still, obviously, there are going to be some issues. Trade is one, and uh, the US cut size, another one. Sanctions for uh, against Russia, which impinge on us for the S 400 missile that we want to buy, we're going to buy. And that would be friction. And that leads to friction with Mizar RD in Iran also. So uh, these are issues that will continue. And the two sides will have to learn to live with this and, and somehow carry on with life without this. But today, dealing, you know, we have to realize a few things when we deal with the United States. I mean, we know it mostly, but 
we tend to forget it is the strongest military on earth but its success rate has been very poor after world war 2 its military power has not delivered the results that power was supposed to deliver starting in vietnam even korea was a stalemate so uh, 30 years after cold war they still have about 1000 military bases all over the world we divide our country military commands inside the country the united states divides the whole globe it has a central command that has the oil rich gas rich regions it has specific command the biggest firms africa command northern command southern command and so they they divide the whole and they have military deployments everywhere it's the biggest defense budget its intelligence budget is twice the budget of our defense forces entire defense force so you see the difference it has no bound bound land boundary threat we have two both are nuclear armed and both are inimical to us war does dead little you the united states has two peaceful seas both sides so wide that there cannot be an immediate threat to the mainland without the united states knowing about it theoretically but um, we have the indian ocean region where china is showing special interest and it's not just showing interest in the seas it is showing interest in our neighborhood or our neighbor so when india and us sit down to talk one country is talking from a position of comfort comfort great comfort i should think we are talking to them in a position where we have we are hemmed in we have two land borders like this one will intrude militarily if he wants the other will send terrorists so our our development process the process of socio economic development gets hampered when you have two standing armies the entire standing army deployed on two borders all the time which country does that to so we are the ones we are in a we are in, in that that cauldron where uh, everything is maybe happening so unfortunately as being the largest democracy in terms of numbers the country that has done innumerable elections peacefully i mean the, at least the changeover is orderly these days we do have a little bit of violence preceding them these days but the changeover is by the constitution we have managed this despite all the problems all the differences that we had then outside pressures we have kept that going and we have no intention of changing that but there's no democracy bonus for us instead we always found that this fellow next door got benefits we got human rights violation with that in the 1990s i remember where we i was dealing with this issue we uh, we were pressured by the west led by the united states about human rights violations in kashmir but no pressure on pakistan to control terrorists we remember that we remember 1971 when nixon supported pakistan even asked kissinger to hint to the chinese that if they attacked india they wouldn't mind so that was the level of relationship then they come a long long way from that and i think we're going to move forward we are more confident now more self able to deliver our systems are improving our economy is going to boom we're quite sure about it covid was a setback but it was a setback globally so we will we'll recover from it fast i think we're already on the way up if you go by our uh, stock market indexes if you go by our gdp projections by imf so we are we're doing pretty pretty well now we have want to be good strong economic power we have no interest in anything else we have no territorial ambitions we shouldn't actually be saying it but we but that is the truth we don't want it. we know it is not easy to deal with uh, occupied territories now yeah when it comes to us india on the one side we get the pakistan factor on the other side we get the china factor the americans we feel are now restricted in their ability to take on china and i doubt if anything big will happen over taiwan unless the chinese dictate and if xi jinping decides in his mind that this is the time to grab what are the americans going to do they're going to launch missiles so that is their that problem with india usa usa 
China. This that is a rivalry to much higher. Ours is a cooperation at a lower level. The third factor is China in there itself. How does that work out? The Chinese will not move back. It's a loss of face every time. I think they will use Pakistan as a surrogate for labor. We see those signs now, little little indications that we have had terror attacks, personalized individual terror attacks on teachers, doctors, outsiders, simple individual civilians being killed. Not a, not a bomb explosion, not a terror attack of that kind. The Chinese have been putting pressure on us all across the boundary. Sometimes in Ladakh, sometimes in the central area, sometimes in the northeast. So we got we got a problem of having to deal with this same time. This can escalate. Although just now I don't I don't see that happening. People are saying, oh, the Taliban are doing this in India. No, it's not. Taliban can't do it for the simple reason that Taliban speak Pashto or Dari. Kashmiris don't speak either of those languages. They won't get any help. They won't be able to deliver anything. If they are genuine Taliban recruits, if they are Pakistani masquerading as Taliban, which is quite possible, then it's different. No, this is a, quite a good starter, but I have uh, some additional questions that now emerge yeah. out yeah. of these uh, talking points. Uh, the first is... Uh, uh, of course, you address some problematic issues from the past in the bilateral relations between the United States and India. However, during that time, during the Cold War, uh, Pakistan was a strategic ally for the United States. And now this equilibrium has changed significantly because China managed to bring Pakistan to its orbit. Uh, through various um, carrots, uh, specifically the China-Pakistan economic corridor that enabled, basically enabled chi uh, China to get an access yes. to the Indian Ocean, which is a big problem actually for the project, uh, for, for, for the power projection of India in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean region, as you called it. Um, and in addition to that, uh, if we look on the map, uh, there is a second such economic corridor that has been now established in Myanmar uh, with the same goal, namely to connect China and China, uh, China, China's goods uh, and um, Chinese trade via Myanmar to Singapore basically to bypass significant maritime routes that are in the domain of India's, uh, India's uh, power projection. So do you see the possibility that this kind of strings of pearl, as it's, it has been called, basically penetration of India's smaller neighbors uh, by China uh, in um, increasing the presence in these uh, neighbors, but then, of course, also creating political instruments for influence uh, would kind of lead to a situation where India would see itself uh, more or less uh, completely blocked by, uh, you know, by regional, by regional um, neighbors. And in a sense, this kind of uh, um, situation might end also um, in a disadvantage or let's say um, being detrimental to India's interests because you mentioned, and then I'm moving to the second part of this question that is Afghanistan, because uh, if there was one international actor that had clearly contributed largely to the reconstruction of Afghanistan. This was India. And of course, all these kind of investments and uh, engagement with Afghanistan had been put on hold following the ta takeover of the Taliban. So in a sense, India has been uh, certainly isolated from the current equilibrium. We see already the talks between the Taliban and the Chinese authorities or Chinese politicians, uh, or even Turkey has managed somehow to re-enter uh, the great game there. Do you think that also this kind of a new disadvantageous situation in Afghanistan in political terms, but also you mentioned um, spillover effects for terrorist activities, that this will also bring India now 
to uh, the conclusion it needs to diversify its geopolitical portfolio. It needs to move beyond this uh, direct vicinity and to forge new alliances, to forge new partnerships. Uh, and of course, United States here clearly would be such a partner that would actually be interested in you know, forging a new strategic partnership with India in order to create a counterbalance to Pakistan, China. And then, of course, a very provocative additional question to it. Would it be possible uh, to imagine a situation where India would allow American presence, military presence, uh, uh, in order to in engage this kind of neighbors which have become very assertive and detrimental to India's interests? So, four, four aspects, right? Yes. One is encirclement by China and the string of pearls. The second is the effect of Afghanistan. The third is the thinking ahead, would we allow American troops? We've been saying that actually the Chinese move into Myanmar is much older than they move into Pakistan. The Chinese started really moving into, uh, into Myanmar in the 90s. Because that time, foolishly, the world ostracized the military regime in Myanmar. They had nowhere to go. So they became closer to the Chinese. And before that, the Myanmar government never ever dealt with acquisition of armed or military technology from its neighbors. They always went to Germany, Austria, maybe Britain for their army. Now it is all different. Now they've got a direct line up from Yunnan province down to Rangoon and Ake uh, and, and, and the Chinwin side. The same thing is happening in Pakistan. So in a manner of speaking, my border with China is not on the north, it's on both sides, east and west. If they are going to be the dominant power in my two neighboring countries, then effectively I have to face Chinese interests in dealing with these two neighbors. Pakistan would love it. Yeah, perhaps Myanmar not so, but yeah, probably be helpless also. The Chinese are now also this this move into our neighborhood. They, they target being India, therefore getting close to all our neighbors. Bhutan, there are going to be some trilateral, bilateral border disputes soon. Bangladesh, Myanmar, we just spoke about, and they'll have a base there. Then uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal. Many of these countries deal with, with uh, a wary of taking too many loans. They are aware of the, of the debt, and, uh, but, and you don't simply think so. I, I, I assess that the Nepalese are, they want to get they, they want to get things done more through international organizations. The Sri Lankans are a little less careful. Maldivians are not. Bangladesh they take care of not getting into it. Myanmar is the uh, thing is while we have the advantage of geographicity with our neighboring and we've had this for ages. If we play our card well we can fend off the threat from China. But we have to ignore, we have to engage with our neighbors, immediate neighbors, much more effectively, much more serious than we do otherwise. This government has made attempts. Think there is some movement, but not fast enough yet. Many a time, these things get stymied because of their internal political compulsion. Nepalese communists versus Nepalese Congress, pro-Chinese pro communists versus non-pro-Chinese communists. So they have these problems there. That's why the Indian thing, Indian issue gets thrown back. We have to, we, have, we can't help our size. We can't help the size of our problem. We can't help the size of our economy. We can't help the size of our army. We are the biggest here. We're not going to reduce that for anybody else. So we have to adjust dealing with the smaller neighbor. The smaller neighbor shouldn't feel that, like the Nepalese, don't feel that if you look north, they find this bear looking at them, panda looking at them, look south, you find the yellow staring at them. They feel hemmed in. We, we have no imperial ambition. Perhaps if you did, might have been better, but we didn't do that. So that's how it is going to be. We will, I think, in ultimate, when the Chinese get into deep waters, they will, we will get our chance. I think that will happen also. Afghanistan. I think nothing scared everybody more for the departure, matter 
It was a mighty superpower. Gave you the statistics earlier of its strength. And it negotiated with a ragtag force seeking exit, not even a peace deal. And they did it after 20 years. So if you can do this with Afghanistan, you do to me. It is not a military defeat that bothers. It is credibility and the reliability. Then you make domestic laws applicable. You abrogate treaties. You have this AUK, US. You let down for self-defined national interest. So a global power must be able to define its nationalism more broadly. If it wants to be a global and look out for the globe, therefore tomorrow they can abrogate any treaty with us. President changes or he doesn't like the agreement. You walk out of the climate change. Do you know why they, they quit the Quito protocol? Why the last vote that was to be given by America, they didn't do it. Exxon Mobil said, don't do it. Their interest was at stake. They didn't do it. That's, and they're the biggest guzzlers of, look, they guzzle so many hamburgers. 52 billion hamburgers in a year. And the gallons of water that is used for it. Three times 52 is 152 billion. And the gallons of water, 100 gallons or 200 gallons per hamburger. Where will the water come from? It's climate change is not going to begin only by cutting down on coal. It's going to begin in, in Idaho and in Oklahoma as well. That is where the consumption, the biggest consumers of things, fishes. Biggest consumers of hamburgers in the world are the 10 richest countries, including Japan and Korea. The rest are all Europe and America. So unless we all put together, don't just blame these. If you don't use coal, we will have to use hydraulic. That means damming rivers. You can't dam rivers because it affects somebody else. It changes the ecology. You can't use coal because it causes pollution. You won't let us do nuclear power because it causes. Where is my development going to come from? Perhaps solar energy for it. But the world has to work together. See, if it has become smaller because of technology and everything, then this is the meaning of getting of having to work together. If you say there are no borders, if you object to nationalism, then prove it. Otherwise, I will be national. I will learn from the West how to preserve my interests. If tomorrow India and China become the largest two economies in the world, what happens to the rest of the world? So, do you want us to be the second largest economy in the world or not? You can't stop China now. So is this the one that you're going to stop? That's my worry. Serious. And if the United States, despite the good relation that we have today, close frequent exchanges of high-level visits, everything is going on. All the right uh, markers are there. Abandons the treaty. I would rather then deal with Europe as the third pillar. China won't trust me. The United States Will trust me, Mac may walk out. But I would think that Europe is my, the EU is our third largest trade fund. We do a lot together on digital things, on, on trade, tourism, etc. Why not deal with Europe? We haven't taken your EU seriously ourselves. We dealt with EU as France and Germany and separate. Never dealt with EU together. And EU has also gone into the, the Chinese market or resource not paid enough attention to us. So it's for us to, to revive that. But the final thing, American troops, won't happen, won't happen. We won't do it. We had, we had them once, the Britishers came, we won't let them come. Landing facilities, maybe. Refueling stops, maybe. Stationing troops, no. We have the best counterinsurgency force in the world. Let me say that. We are the ones who have fought counterinsurgency since 1947. And we've not lost. And we've not taken assistance from outside. We've done it ourselves. So why 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 should we why should we have the American troops? Do you think do you think that do you think that if there is a, a war with China, if the Chinese attack us tomorrow? God will help. Individually? No. AK, AUK, US will help? No. So why should we have troops here? So, uh, well, that's me saying. I don't know what the government would want to do, but I don't see it happening. Really. Do you see, for instance, uh, the new geopolitical formations initiated by the United States, such as uh, the AUKUS? 
and also quad. Uh, so on the one side, this uh, trilateral security and defense pact between uh, the USA, UK and Australia, of course, meant to um, be, in fact, uh, enhanced in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and on the other side, the quadrilateral between United States, India, Japan and Australia as one way how, for instance, defense capabilities can be can be strengthened uh, and uh, military drills can be further uh, exercised. And that would be one way how America creates a military counterbalance without institutionalizing these uh, formats. You don't have a new organization. You don't have Asian NATO. You don't need all of this kind of uh, institutional formats, but in a sense, uh, political will is there and you have a leadership behind it. And in a certain way, you create a new uh, equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific where China is suddenly faced with uh, more uh, proactive uh, handling of uh, the region. Well, two, two, two ways of looking at it. You see, NATO had had a goal. NATO had an enemy. Communism, communist Russia was their goal. Years ago, years ago, when they first talked about a four-nation alliance kind of thing in Asia, I had gone on a visit to China in 2007. Everywhere I went there, are you going to have an Asian NATO? 13 years ago, 14 years. Nothing happened. It was all disgusting. Now, this quad has come into being. It's a nice, talks about stability, peaceful intention, etc. Et you know, the usual diplomatic words. Is there something hidden behind that? I don't know. Is there a secret clause somewhere? I don't know. Because unless we define a common goal, what are we together for? So, unless we are able to pinpoint that, say we are in it because of this Australia, the UK, the US. Pardon my saying so, but what is the military strength without India? Those submarines that they're going to build will take 20 years, 15 years, 12 years to come. Till then, is the, are the Chinese going to wait for you? The Chinese are vicious. Xi Jinping wants something done by 2020. Before his third term, they say there are differences within leadership and if you don't like him at all, they would like him to go and he's ambitious. This is campaign against corruption against generals is, is rebounding on him. I don't know the real truth of it. Hard intelligence now. But something is, is missing in China. This anxiety to produce results, anxiety to get on with it. Uh, there is uh, there is a chance that this is the only way we can manage it. No. And uh, this business of now trying to re-engage with Talib, just don't understand. If you 20 years against this fellow, we know what he is. He's going around hanging people. He, he's stifled freedoms. He stifled the women. You want to deal with him and give him aid. So what? This is what the Pakistanis wanted. That we first. The United States lost in Afghanistan because of Pakistan. It's dual policy. Taliban won in Afghanistan because of Pakistan. So, if you, you know, most of us knew in October 2001 when they decided that they would take on Pakistan as the most, as a major non NATO ally, we knew that the United States is going to lose. They didn't know when or how. They're not going to win. No one believed us. No one said this could happen. You've spoken about the two uh, major regional uh, problems India is simultaneously facing. Uh, on the one side, of course, uh, Pakistan, and on the other side now China, which is also amassing troops along the line of uh, actual control. They have already deployed allegedly uh, the S-400, which they've already received. India is awaiting its S-400. In a sense, we see once again in Russia, is going mm -hmm. to witness a kind of a very problematic, problematic uh, situation uh, on the one side with its traditional, traditional friend and partner 
India. On the other side, the dragon bear, this kind of increased uh, systemic coordination with China to basically tackle uh, the US problem, the US influence in global affairs. So do you see a situation where India might engage in a kind of a normalization of relations with Pakistan in order to reduce the number of potential and real problems, uh, geopolitical problems it uh, is having. So in a sense, to focus on the, 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 the increasing number of tensions coming from China, you will need a kind of a normalization of relations with Pakistan because you cannot tackle simultaneously both uh, issues, both neighbors. Do you see that this is a realistic way of looking at, at the relations in the future or you don't see any kind of window of opportunity? And a second question unrelated to this one is because you've already outlined some of the problems uh, regarding China. What is your assessment about uh, Xi Jinping's leadership? What comes next post-COVID? Uh, what is your anticipation for his leadership? Will he survive actually politically uh, what's going on on the ground in China? Does he have enough cards to do so? Or, or do you think that he, would, he might engage in a kind of a foreign adventure? I am inclined to think of other authoritarian powers that did so in the past, without naming names, uh, in order to politically survive. Your last question first. Dictators, when in trouble, normally go in for foreign adventures. And the foreign adventure Xi Jinping might want to try is either Taiwan or India. Taiwan, if their assessment is that that would bring a massive American response, they'll probably not do it. So it is depends on their assessment of American intentions. The alternative is India, where they could they could try a two-pronged attack. Pakistan does the terror bit, they do the military bit. So we have a two-front war. It can, the thing is, if you start a war like that, do you have the means to control it? So their lines will also get extended beyond a point. The Indian Army of today, the Indian Armed Forces of today are different from the 7, the 71, or whatever. So it's not easy for either of them to take this forward. But raising temperature, creating a scare, possibly. But it would be, it would be rather foolish to try anything bigger. It's not a cakewalk. And should he lose in this gamble when he's kapu? Not. So he has to be a high gambler to try either of these two. Okay. And the other one, the possibility of our talking to Pakistan, coming to a deal with Pakistan. I know it's 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 a difficult uh, choice that governments are going to have to make. But we see no joy in Pakistan ever changing its stance. And here is the Prime Minister of the country, goes to the United Nations, walks to the press and central world body. All he can talk is Kashmir and India. No vision, nothing, nothing at all. So you, they have made Kashmir and India as the anchors on which their country depends. If you remove that enmity, then they're gone. Believe you. They just become a bunch of warring uh, sub-national but we can't therefore say we will talk to you because we collapse. The other fear now is that if they are not able to handle Afghanistan properly and if they are refugees, what do we do? You would like to send them to Europe, but that is, that is not the solution. So we, we, we feel that uh, Pakistan is unable to reconcile that cannot, it cannot get, it is unable to reconcile that. You know, the more Islamic you become, the more Islamist you become. So now they cannot, they, they want to say that no Muslim should be ruled by a non-Muslim. But good God in heaven, they've got a Hindu right-wing leader now in India. 
and that's bad news for, for, for that kind of thing. Pakistan is not able to reconcile to itself and say they cannot take Kashmir, need to forget it, and deal with India as a normal, then we can find some hope. But if we don't, I don't think we, will, we should be making any first. I must have a declaration of intent and a evidence of that you have given up this attitude. You, want, you don't have to be my best friend living next door. Neighbors are not necessarily the best of friends, but you can have a moment, you know, modus vivendi, staying together, living together, your common problem, you can have trade, you can have tourism, you can have business relations, then you can still be independent. You don't want to, to, to you yours to be mine. But to say, no, I want your country and I want this part and I want that part. Who's people out? Years ago, years ago, Indra Gujral, one of her prime ministers, was asked a question by a Pakistani journal about the solution to Kashmir. So Gujral told him, it has been solved. He said, how? He said, because you can't take it from us and we won't give it to you. So go figure it out. It is not a problem of our creation. Kashmir is. We have a document which says that the accession was to India. They are the invaders. They are the ones who are occupying my land and no one has asked them to leave because it suited uh, global interests at that time. Like that. during the Cold War, many adjustments were made. This was one of them. So uh, we have, this is a problem that's going to live with us unless Pakistan changes its mind. We are not. And it has, maybe it has slowed us down our economy. Maybe we would have done a little better than that. But we had certainly been pretty good now. We will become a $10 trillion dollar and that's what I tell my friend. I said, don't talk too much about geo strategy and this and that. Just get on by with making your country economically strong. Everyone will come to you. Everyone. So uh, have patience. We'll be fine. We'll be a democratic country. We won't be a closed society that uh, that's hounds and myths, uh, millions concentration camp because they are of a different religion. We are taught about human rights, but nobody has stopped dealing with China because of this human rights violation. First. It's economically not viable. We will have to. That's the that's the reality of geopolitics, geoeconomics. We have money. We have to. That's the present way of looking at. If you're rich, you get power. If you get power, you get rich. I have um, an additional question regarding to. Uh two middle powers, so to say, in the emerging new global order. The one uh, is related to Russia. How will Russia navigate uh, through this complex relationship between uh, China, India and Pakistan? On the one side, we are observing, like I said, a systemic coordination in various socioeconomic domains between Beijing and Moscow. The trade volume has increased significantly. Russia has been providing electricity and also has um, um, basically increased also the volumes of, uh, you know, energy supplies to China following this uh, traveled, uh, travel period, uh, uh, current period now in, uh, for, for, for Chinese economy. On the other side, Pakistan also new deals, trade deals, energy deals. A uh, new pipeline is in the making. So obviously, there is an interest on the side of Moscow to uh, to actually uh, get a kind of a, a new mode of relationship. But then on the other side, India has been a traditional partner uh, throughout the whole period of the Cold War and afterwards, uh, still very strong, predictable relations in various fields which Moscow is certainly going to uh, further uh, sustain. So how do you see um, the future role of Russia in South Asia and specifically in the bilateral relationship? This is the one question I have. The second is related to the European Union and the European powers because you mentioned them already. And it's interesting that on the day when the European Union announced its a uh, long-awaited strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, on the very same day, uh, United States, uh, UK and uh, yeah. Australia announced the AUKUS. Uh, so uh, really bad timing, so to say. Obviously, no coordination between the two initiatives. Um, 
oh, okay, we can interpret the, the move by the European Union as a positive one. In a sense, the European Union wants to bring itself in the region. You mentioned digitalization, connectivity, economic trade ties. This is definitely the portfolio of the European Union and the European powers. But France is also an Indo-Pacific nation. It has actually, uh, it has uh, not only military presence, it has, uh, uh, you know, still uh, uh, the largest Indo-Pacific presence uh, for yes. European power, um, undisputedly. Uh, so in a sense, it was a backstabbing for France specifically, but also for the efforts of the European powers to come up with a with a you know, new, new, new approach to the Indo-Pacific. And in addition to this, this has been a, it has been a milestone for the European Union in the relations with India, particularly because the negotiations on free trade agreement uh, have been relaunched. They have been put on hold in 2013. Now they have been relaunched this year. Free trade agreement with India stands much higher in the hierarchy of trade relations between the European Union and third powers as the investment deal with China, much higher. So it obviously has, uh, you know, much stronger impetus on India uh, to settle the trade relations with India uh, as compared to China. And uh, at the very same time, this also sends a very strong signal to the region and specifically to India that there is a readiness, institutional, political and so on, to engage with uh, India. And yes, of course, you are right. If you become strong economically, then other powers are coming to you. So I think that this is exactly the shift right now in the thinking on the one side because of the problematic relations with China, but on the other side, because India is en route to become to becoming such major uh, geoeconomic power that it's about time to do something. So do you think that the European Union needs to become a security actor in order to be perceived as a significant partner for India and for the Indo-Pacific nations. Uh, I see also a major problem in the fact that the strategy for the Indo-Pacific, the European strategy, actually does not recognize United States as an Indo-Pacific nation. So in a sense, it actually excludes the United States from the Indo-Pacific region. But then again, just yesterday, we observed that the United States and the European Union came together to discuss cooperation on the Indo-Pacific. So a kind of a dichotomy, um, I sense a kind of a dichotomy in the whole thing. I sense a kind of a fragmentation in the Western approach to right, India yes. and to the Indo-Pacific. So I would like to know what is your assessment, what is your assessment and anticipation for this whole, okay. you know, Okay. Period of initiatives and Russia. Developed. Let's start. Let's start with Russia, China, India, US, the neighborhood. The whole thing started shifting when we started shifting our relationship with United States with the nuclear deal. And, sorry, things started actually happening after the Soviet Union collapsed, and we had ten years still Putin game of uh, wilderness, shall I say, with Russia in their relations had gone into on the back, back burners. When Putin came, the thing revived and we were back, getting back into top gear. Although the basic supplies and all facilities had become slow and sluggish, but they were there. With Putin, there was an impetus and we started warming up. Then we did that nuclear deal with America and uh, you could see a sense of the, the Russians so hey, what's this? If they wanted to reassess their entirety perfect. And uh, I think from then on, with our relation with America, we had things happening in the Middle East where uh, Russians got into Syria. You know, they got a toehold in the whole thing in the Middle East mess. They also felt that they needed to be present in the eastern flank of the Muslim world as much as the western flank. So they began to mend with Pakistan bilaterally. There's, there's hardly anybody who can object to that. They, they tell you, we are still your best friend, we continue with our deal, but you know, Pakistan is also a country and we've got Taliban problems, we've got drug problems that come to that place. So we have to deal with Pakistan. 
and it has been progressively going in that direction. I don't know what the trajectory is of this relationship, particularly because Pakistan is in a mess itself. So I don't think the Russians will rush into anything concrete in the near future. They will wait for this Taliban mess to sort out, for Pakistan to sort out its, its economic mess. I don't think they have the means to support Pakistan. In fact, the Chinese are not able to support Pakistan. So who is going to support Pakistan in its economic mess is probably going to be the Americans again. And what will the Americans want for that to be happening? We don't know. I don't know what the Americans want. They, they just want now to have it, to give the appearance of being the good guys in the end, coming to sort out problems in Taliban. You know, play that Samaritan role. But Russia, China is a different thing. I think Russia and the Chinese are far closer today than they ever were. Since the Usuri assault in 1960, they actually fought battles on the Usuri River. So now they are close together. The Russians are giving them gas as much as they want, Siberian gas, and technology. They were pretty good technology. Let's not underestimate the Russians. And, and as, as a American software chief in the Pentagon said the other day, he resigned. He said, we lost out our battle to China in the artificial intelligence game, and we've done nothing to revive it. So there is there is a strong combination taking place there. They will they will have this. I imagine all these systems have uh, have fissures, have problems. The EU and, and Americans' the latest witness is the AKUS and the AUKUS and the, the EU. Uh, Announcement on the Indo-Pacific, this show of dichotomy. So this these things will happen with Russia. I mean, that's okay. But their intention is to together take on the United States. And there we are, right in the middle, nowhere to go. Next 10, 20 years, if the Chinese are able to hold on, they're able to an orderly system of governance. Orderly doesn't necessarily mean only authoritarian. It means a system that works. I believe corruption is very high. Discrimination is very high, things are very high, surveillance is very strong. So somewhere it, say, the bubble might burst, pressure cooker might explode, then what? So, uh, the Russian Chinese are uh, going to take on, the Russians would want to have a presence from Pakistan to Israel, everything in between. You see a withdrawal of it, you see the Chinese will move into Iran, via Afghanistan. So they'll have three ports, Karachi, Wada, Persian Gulf. Djibouti is separate, the Red Sea. So we're getting ready for a new, new Cold War with China, lead opponent for them. At the end of this uh, uh, conversation, I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Vikram Sood, for your excellent insights on India, its geopolitical and geostrategic choices. Uh, in this rapidly deteriorating environment, and specifically uh, when it comes to the future relationship with the United States, with China, Pakistan, Russia, and the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on your show. It was a great pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Varta podcast. If you want to see more content like this, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We started Bharatvarta to facilitate long-form discussions on politics, policy, and culture. We don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode. If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharatvarta on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website, www.bharatvarta.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai.